Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Hubcast. Or this is a Hubinar, not a Hubcast. That's the other thing that I do. And I'm with Kylie today, uh, Randy Hawthorne here, the executive director, uh, kind of getting off to a bumpy start. And Kylie is making me put my picture on the screen again because she's doing it, and I felt like I had to do it. And again, I did not dress for the occasion. So this is my COVID attire, T-shirts. <laughs> I'm wearing shorts. It's 90 degrees here. <laughs> How are you doing, Kylie? <laughs> I'm, I'm great. It's definitely not 90 degrees here. <laughs> no, Vancouver is beautiful. <laughs> it's beautiful, yeah. <laughs> well, I don't want to take a bunch of your time because you have a lot of good things uh, to, to, to talk about today. I just want to thank you for being here. And then I'm going to remove myself and then be your backup person for all the cool things that you have planned for this. So <laughs> take Thanks it away. Much, Randy. Thanks, Randy, and thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, so today we're going to talk about tips for nonprofit survival, and I just want to start off by acknowledging that uh, I'm giving this webinar on the ancestral territories and unceded lands of the Squamish Nation here in Vancouver, British Columbia, and uh, I'm very fortunate to be able to work, live, and play on these lands. Uh, I've got two learning objectives for our time today. Uh, I'm not going to read them because you guys can read seven times faster than I can talk, but um, it's my hope that by the end of this hour that uh, we will have accomplished this little bit of learning for you today. Uh, just a, a quick overview of who I am. So I am, I'm a, a consultant to not-for-profits and a, an evaluator and a strategic planner and a program sustainability planner um, based in British Columbia. And I have my own uh, company, which I'll talk about a little bit later on. Um, these are some of the uh, places where I've learned and had the opportunity to work. And uh, yeah, so that's who I am briefly. We're gonna start off with a poll question because this is a, uh, an interactive session. So I'm curious if any of you have encountered this question on a grant application. What are your plans for ensuring the sustainability of this initiative? So Randy's gonna uh, launch the poll for us. And there it is. And we'll just see uh, how many people have voted. Great, see, it's getting up there. About 68, 70%, 71. Perfect. Yeah. The other people are like get, getting their coffee, but we're almost yeah. there. Maybe we'll, we'll just, some people are them, thinking hard. <laughs> you put them into action way too soon, huh? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I think it's really slowed down, so we'll just leave it at that point. I'm gonna share the results for, for you all. Can, uh, can you see, can everybody see this? Yeah, we're so, at about 74% yes, and yeah, the yeah. It's a very, yeah. It's a very common question. Uh, and so back to me sharing my slides, then my question for you is, and they're coming along, is, wait for it, wait for it, my slide. Okay, is like, yeah, what do you say? What do you say when you have that, when you, when you have that question on a grant application form? If you, if, Let's use the Q&A box for any questions that you have, but also any comments, and that way we can make this kind of an interactive session. So I'm just curious, like, what do you say when you get that question? So I have done more than my share of grant proposals, and I'd be like, I don't know, uh, what, what do you want me to say? Uh, just give me the money so I can get going with the project, right? But it is, it's a really common question. So about 15 years ago, I was working with a very large health organization in British Columbia, and um, they called me one day and said, wow, we just got a million dollars from our uh, head office to do some very innovative community-based programming. We're really excited about this, and we're going to start by setting up all sorts of pilot projects with community-based agencies in our neighborhoods, but we don't know what's going to happen at the end of the first year. We have a million dollars for a year. We don't know if it's going to be renewed. Is there anything you can do, Kylie, to help us kind of ensure the sustainability of these new pilots that we set up? And I thought, wow, that's a really good question. I don't know. So I went out and researched everything I could about program sustainability and nonprofit sustainability. And uh, what I found was actually really shocking. It was, uh, there was a lot of very interesting research out there where researchers had compared programs that continued year after year 
even after their major funding ran out versus ones that had to hold. And they looked at what was the difference between the two. And I'll tell you that nothing that I was reading was rocket science, but I never heard anybody talk about it. I never heard people talk about sustainability planning. I'd never seen these things presented under the umbrella of sustainability and longevity. So what I ended up doing, I was so excited by what I was learning, was I put it together as a workshop and I gave it all sorts all over the place and then I put it together as a webinar, which I've been giving for years all over North America. And then a few years ago, I decided to just put everything I knew about program sustainability into a guidebook, which I'll show you at the end. So I do want to start off by, um, as we go through this session, I'm going to uh, talk to you about what some of the research has shown. But I, I do want to have, a, I have a small caveat that um, if I was your fairy godmother, I would just wave my wand and you, know, you would get lovely sustainability. It would be as easy as that. And it's not necessarily that easy. So some of the uh, factors that I'm going to talk about that the research identifies are relatively easy to implement. Some are more like a bit of more of a long-term effort. And I also, in these days of COVID, I also want to not come across as being too Pollyanna-ish uh, with some of these solutions. I want, I want you guys to understand that I understand the extreme pressures that nonprofits in Canada and the United States are under right now. Um, and I have this slide up here to just show you that one of my most recent contracts in May was to analyze the data of a survey of all the uh, 25,000 nonprofits in British Columbia to see what was the impact of COVID. And it's the same here as it is down in the United States. It's not pretty. So uh, I just don't want you guys to think I'm naive uh, in some of the suggestions that I'm going to be making in the next hour. But at some point, nonprofits are going to, they're going to be, some people are going to have a major body blow, but at some point, uh, there are things, there's a, some things that you can do now, and I'm going to be showing you uh, a very practical exercise towards the end that you can do like tomorrow with your organization. Um, but at some point you will be rebuilding your nonprofit uh, when it starts, you know, when the money starts flowing again. And uh, you, some of these uh, factors will help you kind of get things off to a very solid foundation. Okay, let's just do a little quick brainstorm in the q and A. I'm curious why you think sustainability is important. Why should a, a, a nonprofit be concerned with their own sustainability, either of the organization as a whole or uh, for their programs? So just go ahead and type your ideas in to the uh, chat, and then I'll be able to kind of see them and read some of them out. Um, and uh, I see that Jane mentions that they're always seeking support from different areas, their memberships, their foundations and corporations to support their group. Um, so continuity, continuity is really important uh, reason why, why you wanna continue the work that you're doing. You don't wanna be doing two steps forward and one steps back, right? That continuity can really affect your, your clients. Uh, Tim talks about how important it is your mission, right? And let's face it, missions don't get accomplished in a year, right? Missions are a long-term game as well well and so you need that sustainability to kind of stay focused and to really kind of start to have those long-term effects. Um, Jeremiah mentions the clients and the people that you help right that they're depending on you to be there that these you know you can't kind of close your doors and then open them again and close them and then open them again um, uh, and talks about having that momentum right and it's so discouraging when you lose that momentum you're really making progress you're making inroads and then all of a sudden you lose your funding and you've got to shut things down for a, a while right um, there's all sorts of um, great ideas here guys that I'm seeing in in the Q&A so thank you um, for me, this is the, the best analogy for why maintaining your sustainability is so important, right? Otherwise, it's like a game of snakes and ladders. You're doing really well. I'm going up my ladder. Look at me. I'm getting to like space 37. And then you hit a snake and <sighs> you go back down again, right? And that's not serving anybody very well. Uh, and let me tell you, another compelling reason is your staff. Uh, if you can't maintain staff and maintain salary staff, then you risk them walking out the door for very good reasons and uh, there's a lot that walks out the door with your staff as well right when you can't maintain that sustainability okay um i want you to here's this here's your second brainstorming 
assignment, I want you to think of a program or an, an organization that has demonstrated sustainability and longevity over time. And what do you think are some of the generic characteristics of that organization that has allowed them to demonstrate that sustainability? What do you think it is about that uh, organization that you're thinking about that permits them, gives them that longevity? So just type some ideas that you have uh, and then we'll, we'll actually look at what the research says. So um, Ula says they've got good marketing and they're well known. Yeah, definitely. Catherine says they've got a reputation in the community. Definitely. Uh, Beth notes that they have a spirit of innovation, right? Uh, I can definitely see that. Anne says they've got broad support from their stakeholders. Mm -hmm. uh, Bert is thinking about the, the Red Cross who has very determined volunteers. Yeah, you guys are hitting all of the, all of the, um, the ones that I was finding in the research. See, I told you it wasn't rocket science, right? It's almost like best practices for operating uh, a nonprofit. So um, when I was going through all this research, I basically culled 28 factors that uh, came from the different studies. And these were studies in uh, organizational development, in nonprofit, and they were also studies, um, a lot came from public health and population health as well who are always kind of launching pilot programs and trying to see if they work. And if they work, then they want them to continue. So I was able to call 28 factors that uh, came up in, in the research. Some of these came up a lot. Some only came up in a couple of studies. I've put them all together in, in this sheet that you will find uh, in the handouts. There's two handouts. Uh, if you see on your GoToWebinar panel, you'll see two handouts. One, one is a copy of this and an overview of everything I'm talking about. And your second handout is a, a, a link to an online bingo card. And hopefully we'll get some time to do a little interactive bingo as a, as a learning activity. So um, in the time we have, I won't be able to cover all 28 of these factors, but I, what I do want to give you an overview of is the ones that seemed the surfaced the most, the ones that surfaced again and again in studies as, as key factors that influence the sustainabilities of your programs and your nonprofit organizations. So let's go through them quickly. So the first one is a little bit of a no-brainer. It's, it's the external funding environment. Um, but I have to mention it because it, it's, it's a very strong. Uh, I, I can't say that it's a predictor of your sustainability. It's a correlate. It's something that's strongly associated with your sustainability. Um, but the thinking is, is that um, if the external funding align, if the external funding environment aligns with your mission, you're going to have a better chance of getting funding and being um, uh, being able to stick around longer. So, for example, if your uh, mission is all about homelessness and uh, federal funding is really big on homelessness these days, chances are that uh, your programs, your organization is going to get that funding that you need to keep going. But it's also uh, having diverse sources of funding. So, typically, when I when I uh, work with groups, I'll say, how many sources of revenue does your organization have? And they'll say something like, well, we get a grant uh, from uh, this organization and, and a grant from this foundation and this grant. But grants are only one source of revenue. So using your Q&A box, what are some additional sources of revenue for uh, a nonprofit? And sorry, I said chat, I meant the Q&A. <laughs> the q a so just what are some what are some additional um sources where what, what are some other ways that we can bring revenue in into our organization so tracy mentions consulting yeah fee for service definitely uh bert's got membership dues and julie mentions individual contributions yeah which are a, a very nice sustainable source of revenue because uh, you can direct those money that those funds to where you know best um, Nancy mentions uh, corporate and foundation and estate planning, and Melanie's got online donations, and Pam mentions fundraising, and by that, Pam, I think you mean kind of like special events and things like that. Maybe you want to clarify that. Uh, and we've also got fee-for-service and providing services. Yeah, so, so, so think of each of these sources of revenue as a table leg. And if your organization has four table legs and one of those is taken out, your little table isn't, isn't going to tip over. This is a table, guys. Can you see that? It's, it's not a bunny. It's not a bird. <laughs> Shadow art. 
anyways, okay, get back on tap, Kathy. Um, let's look at the next factor. The next one uh, that came up in studies is having significant in-kind resources. So in-kind resources, these are donations that are not monetary in value. So they could be things like locations or photocopying or printing or something like that. And, you know, the importance of in-kind as a sustainability promoter really came really came through to me years ago when I was on the board of a organization in the downtown of Vancouver in a very depressed area. And this was an organization that uh, offered a drop-in center for women working in the sex trade. And being on the board of this organization was was kind of terrifying sometimes. It was like this this riding a roller coaster would be like, We'd be going up, we'd have lots of money, and then we'd be going down and, and the money would get spent. So, you know, a famous female philanthropist would walk into our office and say, oh, here's a check for $60,000. And we'd go, yay, that's great. Let's hire extra staff and open up on Saturday and Sunday nights. This is marvelous. And then three months later, the money would be spent or whenever. And so then we'd have to go down and we'd have to close on Saturday and Sundays and we'd have to lay that staff person off. And then the local women United Church Women's Auxiliary would come in and they'd bring us a check for 25,000 and we'd go, yay, let's bring that staff person back and let's see if she can work on Saturday nights and everything would be fine for a while until the money was spent and then we'd go down again. But it dawned on me that at that point, the organization had been around for 24 years and had never once had to close their doors. And the reason was, was because they had such high levels of in-kind. So they were operating out of a church space. In fact, they were operating out of the foyer, believe it or not. Uh, all the food for the programming was donated and they had a huge core of volunteers as well. So when the going got tough, this organization could hunker down and just weather the storm or the drought until things opened up again and they could keep and keep going. And that was because of having such high levels of in-kind resources. Uh, another factor or promoter of your sustainability is simply having a sustainability plan. And there was one study that I looked at that was really fascinating. They looked at 95 uh, lapsed youth programs in Virginia that uh, it was a federal program and then after five years the funding ran out and it wasn't renewed and of those 95 lapsed programs only five of them had had any kind of a sustainability plan so it's this idea that if you're proactive and think about this then it's going to work in your favor and i think this cartoon sums it up perfectly right we just we we don't know when the asteroid is going to fall and imagine i've been giving this workshop for like 15 years, but guess what? The asteroid has fallen. COVID, the COVID asteroid has fallen, right? Um, so it's it's this idea of kind of being prepared if we're, um, yeah. So here's another poll that um, we're gonna launch. And I'm just kind of curious, does your organization have a strategic plan? So Randy's gonna launch the poll for us. Thank you. And people are voting much quicker than before, which is great. Almost there, folks. Yes or no? Some people are thinking hard. We'll just give you another 30 seconds or so, checking our time. We're good for time. Okay, I think I'll just close it and share the results. Oops, are they sharing? They are now. They are now. Okay. Oh, you know what? We're both touching the button at the same time. Okay. Sorry. I'll behave myself. I won't touch it. Okay. Get off my buttons. Okay. Get off my buttons. Okay. So there we go. Okay. So that's interesting. 66% have a strategic plan. Okay. Randy, if you want to launch the second or the next uh, question, uh, because what I'm curious about is how many of you have a sustainability plan? So go ahead and do your voting for that one. All right, we're getting up there, great. Looks like we're almost paused. Okay, good, it's slowing down. So thanks, Randy, you're 
or on the ball. So if you want to share the results, I won't touch it. Yeah, so interesting, eh? So this is, I find this very uh, common. So two thirds of you have a strategic plan, um, but two thirds of you do not have a sustainability plan. And uh, almost one in five, uh, you, you, you're not really sure if, if you do or not, right? Um, and, the, and the interesting thing, and I'll just say this about, just advancing my slides, I'll just say this about sustainability planning. I know that strategic planning can be really awful, right? Ooh, it can be like, oh, oh it goes on day, I have to give up a Saturday, nah. But sustainability planning is actually not like that. Uh, it, it doesn't last nearly as long. And um, I can usually work with a group uh, doing one starting at nine, and we can usually be done by about two o'clock. And, and people feel really energized because the sustainability planning session is, is, is usually kind of just a really structured brainstorming session and uh, a lot of the strategies that come out of your sustainability planning session go right into your strategic plan so um, you'll see that when I when I talk about some of the other um, factors later on okay so I'm just going to advance keep advancing okay so let's keep going with some of our promoters of nonprofit sustainability uh, so also having uh, multiple sustainability strategies so not just like putting thinking okay well if our funding runs out or if the COVID asteroid hits uh, we'll do this right it's it's having more than one strategy this is an example of a sustainability action plan this was for a group that does uh, it's a bear conservation group right I'm from British Columbia right bears in the garbage all the time um, but you can see here that they've got and in, in our left hand column there's a number of sustainability strategies that they decided are appropriate for them to pursue and then we get specific in terms of who's going to do what specific tasks and you assign it responsibility or whatever. So that's just an example of what a sustainability plan might look like. And um, yeah, again, a lot of the strategies that come out of your sustainability planning can fit right into your strategic plan. So another really strong correlate of uh, your longevity is uh, having done an evaluation, having some kind of documented evidence of your worth and evaluation. So really quickly, just in the in the Q and A, just write yes if you've had done any kind of evaluation work in your organization. Um, if you've done an impact evaluation or an outcome evaluation, these can be uh, really uh, well. If they come up in the research again and again and again, as really strongly associated with sustainability, and I think it's because. Um, it, it, what, particularly when it's external, but I mean, we'll take any evidence that you have. It's a way of demonstrating that you're a proven entity, that you're effective, that uh, you're worth supporting, right? And you're worth sticking around and you're worth refunding as well. Um, so yeah, and uh, impact evaluation, outcome evaluation, process evaluation, just even you know determining if things are on track and operating the way they do. But if you can have that kind of piece of, documented evidence that say, yeah, look, you know, we're, we're worth continuing, we're worth supporting, we are, we are a proven entity. Um, a strong volunteer base also is strongly associated with your nonprofit sustainability. And um, what do I want to say about this? I guess it's this idea that, um, don't tell the unions that I said this, but it's this idea that, you know, if the going gets tough and you need to lay staff off, there may be situations where volunteers can keep the door open or just keep things limping along until you're able to kind of start things up again. And it's it's a little bit like um, uh, a seed, right? It, you're, you think of your nonprofit as a seed. And right now under COVID, we're, we're in a drought right now, but at some point it will begin to rain. So what do you need to do to just kind of keep yourself hunkered down and safe under the ground so, so that you don't die, but that when it does start to rain, you can, you can blossom again. And volunteers are one way to do this. Uh, and, and kind of an tangent to this is, there's studies that have shown that when uh, you have a significant amount of your programming that can be delivered by volunteers in addition to or instead of staff, that also plays really well into your longevity. And I remember there was one study that found that uh, programs that were, were kind of based on a train the trainer model uh, where you had peers or whatever going out in the community and doing the work had a five time five times greater likelihood of being sustained over time, which was really interesting. 
this came, uh, this kind of uh, concept really came home to me once when I was doing an evaluation of a, of a peer harm reduction uh, worker program. So I was working with some street nurses who worked uh, with street involved individuals and homeless uh, injection drug users. And what they did was to extend their work, they um, trained some uh, very high functioning peers to in harm reduction practice. So these people carried around the same bag that the street nurses did, and they did things like needle exchange and uh, wound care and just um, safe injection and safe, uh, you know, safe supply education or whatever. And it was for two years, they received an honorarium, but then at the end of two years, the money, the funding wasn't renewed. And so the program died. And they brought me in about, mm, about nine months later to uh, evaluate the impact of the program. And so I did these interviews with these peers, there were seven of them. And I interviewed each one in the street nurse's office, in their head office. And six of these seven peers came nine months after the program had finished, showed up carrying their bag. And I, I was really struck by this. And I said, oh, you're still carrying the bag with your stuff. And they looked at me and they said, yeah, yeah. And I said, so you're, you're but you're not being paid. And they said, yeah, well, I'm still going to do it. It's, I like doing it. I don't really care. And I thought, holy smokes, you know, there's a real message there around sustainability, right? That, that the work is still happening, even though the funding for the program was lost. So uh, something to think about around a peer model or a volunteer delivery model. So this one should probably come as no surprise, but uh, Collaborative Partners also figures very, very strongly in um, enhancing your nonprofit or your program sustainability. And it's a little bit like the table, I'm doing more shadow puppets now, it's a little bit like the table where um, you've got four partners, let's say, in, in one of your services or an initiative, and if one of those partners gets taken out with COVID, hopefully your table won't tip over, that you're able to, to manage until that other partner comes in and you're on better ground. And, you know, I know I've been there with partnerships. Sometimes it's really, it's a lot easier to just go ahead and do it yourself. I know that. Uh, but the, the research around the role of partnerships and sustainability is very strong, very strong. Uh, also, uh, similarly, is having program champions or having a champion for your organization. And champions are, I'm going to ask you in a second to, to let me know in the, in the Q&A whether you have a champion for your organization or a specific program. But champions are like these, there's magical people. They're like you, the closest thing that you can come to a fairy godmother. And they're, they're kind of charismatic, uh, well-connected people who are too busy to be on your board they're certainly not your staff, although they might be like if you're in a large institution or something, they might be a senior manager or somebody. But they're, they're somebody who feels really passionate about what you do, but they're busy because they're high profile or they're super well connected or they're. Um, yeah, and they're too busy to be on your board. They're definitely not your staff. They have this arm's length relationship to you, but when you need them. Uh, they are there for you. They, they're able to do kind of short, intense uh, activities that help you. So a champion might do something like connect you to a contact that they have in government or arrange a meeting for you with the media or they might uh, speak for it, speak on your behalf at a at a town hall or something like that. They can they're they're great at mobilizing. Um, I think you guys probably have had the idea, right? Like champions don't always have to, I, often in workshops I'll say, you know, who might be a champion for your organization? And people will think like, oh, Sarah McLaughlin or somebody like that, she lives in Vancouver. They don't necessarily have to be celebrities. Not everybody can have a celebrity. They can just be somebody who's really well placed in government. I know for many years, HIV organizations in British Columbia, we had this champion in our federal government, Moffitt. And Moffitt like helped us about everything that we needed around funding or or whatever, you know, he just gave us information. Hey folks, here's a heads up, blah, blah, blah. Um, they can be business leaders. 
again, if you're in a large organization, they can be somebody like a senior manager who's like really in your corner. Oh yeah, I'll do what I can to help. But there's something magical about that arm's length distance to you uh, that, that makes them surface again and again and again in all of the studies around uh, longevity and sustainability. Another strong one is, is community support. And uh, you guys mentioned this when we did the brainstorm earlier on. And, um, you know, it, it really is that if you have a community that uh, feels very strongly about the work that you do, then if you are threatened, then they're going to uh, hopefully mobilize and uh, get out in the street to support you and to make sure that you, you don't die. And so this mantra uh, is one of my favorite sayings that I, I use all the time, but people support what they help to create, right? So if we want to have a constituency of community, if we want to have community support, we're always talking about it, right? We really need to have community actively involved in the work that we do, actively involved in the planning, in the uh, execution, in the evaluation of it. Uh, there's a lot of talk of, oh yeah, we have great community support, but oftentimes it's token, right? But people support what they helped create. So the more that you can get community involved, then the more they will feel like, hey, this is my program, don't take this program away. Um, you know, I had um, a daughter, she's 14 now, but um, it, she was, uh, she went through some kind of challenging times with daycare. She was just like a super busy kid. And um, we kind of bounced from daycare to daycare to Montessori. And there was this fabulous um, childcare resource center and toy library that I used to go to. And I remember one day just like breaking down in tears on the desk going, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And like they helped me so much that um, a year later when their funding was threatened, I was like, how can I help? What can I do? What do you need? What do you need? I'll write you a letter. I'll go to the rally. I'll speak. I'll speak to the mayor. You know, whatever. Because I just they had helped me so much, and I feel I felt so invested in this organization. But the problem is, is that uh, when you need to mobilize your community, you often don't have the time, right? Like nobody expected COVID, right? We didn't have the time to to nurture this constituency of of, of support. So now, when you're in the position where you are right now, it, now is the time to say who loves us, who needs us, who would care if we were gone, and start to nurture these folks. Because if things get worse, and let's face it, the predictions are, are not pretty for the future, you're going to need these people. They're, you're going to need them to get out in the streets, write a letter, get on the bus, go to the rally, you know, do whatever is necessary to make sure that you can stick around. Um, the last one I'm going to talk about is um, visibility. And what they found was, uh, and I know somebody said this in the brainstorming as well, but they said um, that how people can't support you and your community can't support you if they don't know who you are and what you do. And typically, you know, like I don't know people, I don't know anybody who works harder than nonprofit managers and frontline staff. Like, you know, when was the last time you took a lunch break, right? But the problem is, is that I think we're spending so much time in the trenches, putting out fires, working hard, we're working away, working away. We're like these little gophers, right? We're down in our gopher hole. We're, we're working away. Oh my gosh, I built this tunnel. Look at how far I went. This is amazing. But the problem is nobody can see what we're doing, right? Because it's all underground. And uh, I think it would be great if once in a while we could just pop our little heads out of the gopher hole and say, Hey everybody, do, do you know what we did today? Do you know who we helped? Do you, do you know how much how much impact we had on, on our community? Like we don't necessarily take the time to do that marketing of, of ourselves or we name ourselves, like we give ourselves a, a nonprofit name that like people have no idea what, what it means. So people can't support you if they don't know who you are and what, and what you do. So taking that time to do that marketing, you know, marketing is not a dirty word, right? Um, I, this was a really interesting one that popped up for me is engaged funders. There was a couple of, of uh, studies that found that the more a funder was familiar with you and, and what you do, the, the greater your likelihood of being sustained. And I think it's this idea that for so many of us, we are just a, a name on an application form and funders don't kind of know what we do. And it's part of that, that visibility issue. But um, we have an opportunity to kind of bring those funders in and, and really give them a sense of 
who we are and who we serve and, and look, this is what, this is us on the ground. This is the work that we do. I used to have a colleague who worked at um, a very large foundation in British Columbia. And she said, you know, I want to be asked out of the office. Give me an excuse to come to your organization and see what you're doing. You know, come like invite me to an open house. And if you don't do open houses, create an open house, but manufacture some kind of reason to get the funder onto your soil to see exactly what you're doing. Or you can do things like give them a call and ask their opinion about, about something. Um, you know, funders are, are very educated people. They have, they have a, an immense amount of knowledge about the nonprofit sector. And, uh, you know, that's something that you can draw on. But basically what you're trying to do is lift your name off of that page and become a real person with real clients and real services, right? You need to kind of get on their radar. So we didn't do all 28 uh, because that would be just, we'd be here for like another hour. But um, in your handouts, and again, if you look on the GoToWebinar control bar, then you'll see that you can download um, them there. Um, you will see, you, you will have this handout for all of the other 28 factors. But uh, 28 is a large number to remember. So I thought maybe what we might do is a little, play a little big game of bingo so that you can have some practice and just reinforce some of the concepts that I've just talked about. So in your handout link, you'll see there's a link to a bingo page. So if you click on that, that's going to take you to an online website where you get your own unique bingo card. So when you've been able to do that, can you start to just, can somebody just say, got it, I've got it, and then I'll, I'll let, that will tell me that people uh, in the Q&A, just let me know that you've got your bingo card and that you're able to download it. And then I'll have a sense of, um, of, of when we're ready to go. Okay, so Jane's got it. Jane wins a prize for being fastest typer and fastest bingo card person. So, okay, great. We've got a whole bunch of people. Go oh, guys, you're awesome. Okay, so I'm just gonna take a little drink and take a nice slow drink while people uh, get their bingo card. You can click your free space. And just like any game of bingo, we will go for a line to start and it can be horizontal or diagonal or vertical. And when I call, so I'm gonna call out each one of these 28 factors. And when I call it out, just kind of reflect on your own situation. Is this something that we have in our organization or, or not? Okay, so here we go. So our first uh, promoter of sustainability, nonprofit sustainability is having a program champion. Having a program champion. And our second is having a strong volunteer base. A strong volunteer base. Our third promoter is high visibility. High visibility. And our next one is clear vision and goals. We didn't talk about that one, but having a clear vision and goals. I think this is the idea that people can get behind you when they really understand what you're trying to achieve. Uh, another one is the external funding environment. So uh, Densi and Deborah, you can find the bingo card under the handouts tab on the GoToWebinar panel. So our last one was external funding environment. And the next one is, we didn't talk about this, but having local values and culture. So having an organization that reflects local values and culture. Uh, the first one, Desiree, was program champions, I believe. Great, okay. Um, our next one. Multi-year funding, multi-year funding. So this is the idea that um, uh, nonprofits that get three years of funding, uh, or ideally five versus one, have a better chance of like having some breathing room and getting things off to, to a more um, a solid foundation and a more sustainable future. And uh, the next one is evidence-informed. 
We didn't talk about that one, but if you're basing some of your initiatives or your services on um, uh, evidence from, from the literature, that seems to play a role somehow in your sustainability. Uh, and it looks like we've got Anne with our first bingo. Congratulations, Anne. I'm not gonna get you to read it out, I, I trust you. Um, but one thing that I will have you do is just uh, type your address in the, uh, your mail, type your snail mail address in the Q&A and we'll send you a uniquely Canadian gift on the way. But uh, we've got time and because this is actually a learning activity to reinforce, uh, let's go for a, uh, shall we go for a full card? Mm, let's go for a full card. I think we can do it. Okay, the next one. So guys, we're not going for a line now. We're going for a full card. Okay, uh, the next one is volunteer delivery. Having volunteers deliver as much as possible. And the next one is sufficient startup resources. So this is the idea that um, if you're going to, you know, if you're going to fund a new program, give them enough money so that they can get off on, a, on the right foot. Also, the next one is transition to policy. So one of the most kind of ironclad ways to achieve sustainability for your issue or your program or your service is to actually make it a policy or a law, right? Like littering or smoking or things like that. We don't spend as much money these days on those issues because hey, it's the law. Uh, the next one, flexibility and adaptability. Uh, that's uh, kind of around the idea of innovation, but you know, if, you, if you're just, if you can kind of go with things, then it enhances your longevity. The next one is uh, significant in-kind resources. And Anne, thank you for your address. And maybe Randy could just write that down for me. That would be great. Okay, our next one is uh, fit with a host agency. So a lot of pilots start out kind of as a little plant in a greenhouse. And uh, that host agency is kind of just caretaking that pilot. They're kind of considered temporary but as time goes on if that pilot uh, kind of demonstrates that it's it uh, adds to the host agency's mission then it may be brought in as a permanent program so if you're going to have uh, a pilot project make sure that it's it's located within an agency where the missions kind of align it'll have a better chance of longevity uh, strategic communication that kind of fits in with the whole visibility issue right but strategic use of your communication so people know who you are and uh, what you do. Our next one, collaborative partners. We talked about that one. And our next one, community driven. We talked about that one. And our next one, are we getting close to having, uh, are we getting close to a full card, anyone? Okay, local government, policymaker, and business support. Local government, policymaker, and business support. Randy, if I miss somebody's bingo, just, just let me know. Uh, response to a clear need. That seems to play a role in your nonprofit sustainability as well. Demonstrated worth and value. Demonstrated worth and value. Oh, I think we've got a bingo. Desiree, that's full card, Desiree, or is it just a line? Need to be sure about this one. Oh. Oh, and Cassiopeia, she's <laughs> been twice. Okay, all right. You guys get the point, right? So there's 28 factors. There's things that you can do. There's concrete things that you can do that you can talk about on that grant application, how you are addressing those factors. Um, what I'm showing you right now is a great little, um, does anybody here like the Cosmo quiz, right? The Cosmo quiz? Well, this sustainability assessment tool is developed by the folks at Washington University at St. Louis. And um, they actually did uh, some very sophisticated statistics called factor analysis to really kind of determine what are, what, what are these uh, predictors of sustainability. And they put it together in this uh, online sustainability assessment tool that you can go on, fill out, and it, it will spit out some uh, uh, your results. There's eight domains, and it just gives you kind of a sense of, you know, these are areas where you're, you're quite strong with respect to your sustainability, and these are some areas that you might want to add a little bit of 
attention to. And so typically I'll use this tool when I do some sustainability planning with groups. I'll have them fill it out in advance. And then when we get together, we'll have discussions about it and we'll use that as a starting place for, you know, what are some of the strategies that you want to develop to enhance your sustainability? Uh, but what I want to show you now is uh, my absolute favorite activity and probably the most practical thing you can do uh, for uh, assess uh, for um, uh, enhancing your sustainability, but it's also probably the best thing that you can do tomorrow uh, with respect to COVID, COVID. And I call this the worst case scenario activity. And typically, you know, I've been I've been doing this activity for about 15 years with groups. And uh, we always did it as a hypothetical situation. I would, I would kind of set things up for folks and we'd be standing at a whiteboard and I'd have everybody out of their seats. By the way, it's, it's a great thing for just getting people energized and moving and, and you know, awake in a workshop. And I would say, I want you to imagine that uh, you've just received notice from your major funder that, that your funding will not be re renewed at the end of this fiscal. And then we take them through the steps of this activity. But ha ha, along came COVID and all of a sudden, folks, a lot of us are facing the worst case scenario. So this is how it works. So often, you know, as nonprofit managers, we're like Atlas, we're supporting this organization on our shoulders and it's a horrible, horrible, nasty burden, right? It keeps us up at night. I'm sure some of you guys are on this call because you've had sleepless nights just worrying about what the heck are we gonna do, right? So when, when, when you're, holding everything as this one big solid mass, it's a terrible, terrible burden. And it's and it's really hard to know, what, what do we do? How do I sustain this massive burden on my back? But what the trick is, is if you can break everything you do down into discrete components, then it's a, you'll have an easier time of planning what, what should we do moving forward? So this is how it works. So the example that I have here, is um, this is a falls prevention program, uh, and it's run by a seniors organization. So I'm gonna I'm gonna show you an example at the program level, and then uh, I'm gonna actually show you a, a live demonstration version at a nonprofit level. So uh, imagine that we've got yellow post-it notes here. Each one of these is a post-it note, and you have it on a window or a whiteboard or something, and so. You get everybody to suggest, okay, what are the different components of this program? And so you can see them here. And then you give the group some continuation options. Now you can come up with your own, but uh, some of the standard ones that I use are, uh, do we maintain this component? Do we scale it back? Do we ask somebody to partner with us in the delivery or do we get them to take it over entirely? Do we just simply not continue or is it like, oh my God, we don't know what to do with it, so let's just put it in the needs more discussion column. And what you do is you facilitate a discussion with your team or your staff or your key stakeholders and say, we have to assign each one of these yellow stickies to one of these uh, columns. And, and the discussion that results is incredibly, incredibly rich. And a lot of sustainability strategies and ideas come out from the discussion. So I'm just going to show you by, um, I've got a live version here so that if you had to do this with your team tomorrow, this is, this is how it would work. Oh my God, did I just, okay, here it comes. All right. So let's imagine then that you've got, you're doing a sustainability planning session or you've got a team meeting. Um, and um, this is this program that I use, um, Bubble Us. It's a great one for doing it online because yeah, I guess your team meetings are on Zoom these days, aren't they? So again, you can you can use whatever labels that you want, uh, but uh, these are ones that I typically do. And I say to folks, okay, uh, we have to assign every single one of these post-it notes to one of these options. So here we've got kind of a, a family, um, uh, a family early childhood kind of family uh, organization and so they might say well you know uh, the volunteers are really important and we've got a great volunteer program and so we're going to put that here we're going to maintain this but the parenting education workshops you know we're not getting a lot of uptake on those right now so maybe we could scale those back and uh, somebody in, in the group says well you know what 
I wonder, scaling it back, I wonder if we could get somebody to actually help us with them. And so then, oh, you just move it over here and you have this great discussion. And somebody will say, what about you know such and such? Why don't we ask such and such if they want a partner? And then there's a discussion and it's really about you know moving all of these around uh, it's the it's the discussion that it engenders. So there might be another discussion where somebody says, you know, healthy snacks. It, it's it's uh, you know we're working in a really privileged uh, white area. You know they 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 don't need we we don't need to spend the money. Or somebody might say, hey, you know, in this community, the healthy snack is really important for families. We need to maintain this. But maybe we scale it back, right? Maybe it's not organic anymore. Mm -hmm. And so there's all sorts of really structured brainstorming and and. Um, Without a doubt, this is the one activity that uh, groups tell me we're like, oh, yeah, I think we can do that. And uh, the program staff, that's one that often if they're sitting in that meeting and you're like, OK, do we do that? Uh, no, that maybe that's a bit sensitive. So let's you have that kind of you have that kind of fail safe or, or what do you call it? That uh, escape hatch or whatever for something that's sensitive or you're just you're not going to solve it in that meeting. So I want to ask you guys now, uh, I want to just open it up if you have any questions about that particular activity. Um, and, I, and I do want to just show you one other slide, which is kind of my favorite analogy for um, this worst case scenario. Does anybody remember this movie from the 1980s, Quest for Fire? Just type yes and let me know if, uh, if you remember this, this movie. Uh, Anybody remember Quest for Fire? Anybody? Yeah, a few do. Okay. So basically, this was a this was a movie about um, a prehistoric tribe that were nomadic, and they had fire, but they didn't have the ability to make fire. So when they needed to leave their feeding grounds and go to the you know the summer or the winter grounds or whatever, they had to the the shaman of the tribe. Stay with me, guys. This isn't flaky. The shaman would take the embers from the last fire and very carefully wrap them in moss or whatever and put it in his little leather pouch. And then they would go over the mountains to the summer valley, which was the summer feeding area. And he would carefully take out the embers and blow on them to start a fire again. And it's that way with, uh, with your the things that you maintain and you scale back. You're trying to identify what are the embers that we need to keep from our operations and our services that we so we can hunker down until this whole horrible time has blown over uh, so that when you know the sun comes out or the rain starts falling again or whatever we can and blow it back up into what it used to be so uh, I'm going to stop there because I've come to the end of the content and just see what kind of question uh, is showing up here uh, so Ula asks, is it helpful to cultivate a political champion if you're not got funded by government funds? Absolutely. It's that arm's length relationship that really somehow there's like this kind of magical thing that happens where people goes, oh, you know, such and such a senator, you know, he's really into whatever your whatever your issue is, you know, and, and he, he's a great supporter of yours. You know, you must be doing something right, right? something like that. So yeah, definite. And and I can just say, you know, uh, cultivating a champion, there's kind of a two-stage process. It's I, strategically identifying who that person is and then also strategically nurturing them as a champion. You don't want to go to the well too often. If you do, you'll scare them and they're like, whoa, I'm sorry, I, I'm too busy, I can't help you. Um, but it's kind of identifying them is kind of the same way that you find board members for your organization, right? If you're a, um, you know, if you're the local conservation association, you're not going to go mining the NRA for for board members, right? You want to try and find a good list, uh, or sorry, a good list. You want you want to try and find a good fit. So yeah, thanks for that, Willa. Um, Amy says, uh, who would you recommend that participates in the activity? I think it, it's definitely staff. Um, I've done this with boards, but board members, but I find that sometimes board members are are uh, I, they, they can definitely come, but when I've done it with just the board, I find they're a bit too removed from operations. So um, definitely a combination. Um, and, and you may have some clients as well. Remember, people support what they help create, right? So a champion can actually be a formal client or a, a current or a formal, 
former clients of your program as well, right? They're arm's length. But if you need somebody to speak up about why this service is so important to my life and this is how it's changed my life or supported me and my family, please don't take it away. That's way more compelling uh, than hearing from the executive director. Uh, Bert is saying, how can we help our local newspaper? It's a key supporter of your organization. Oh, that's interesting. That's a really specific one, Bert. Um, I'm going to just ponder that one while I, while I move on to something a little bit more generic. But I'm, if anybody else has any ideas for Bert or Bert, if you want to provide a few more details, then by all means. Um, I do know that our local nurse newspaper is actually taking donations now. We're, we're contributing uh, five bucks a month for our local newspaper uh, to help them survive. Uh, so that's a revenue stream, right? They've diversified their revenue because the advertising was taken out, right? So now they've added a whole new revenue stream of, of uh, donations and subscriptions. Uh, Cynthia, and I'm watching the time, and feel free to interrupt me, Randy, if I go over. Cynthia is saying, can volunteers be given documentation of the value of goods or services donated for their taxes? Ooh, that's a really good question. I do know one thing that you can do is, uh, is really good practice is to keep track of the total amount of hours that are co contributed by all your volunteers because, because um, that figures very strongly in proposals in terms of uh, as an in-kind donation. Um, in terms of the value, uh, uh, I, I also know that like in Canada at least, we have a certain hourly rate that's, uh, con that we all use for that calculation of what, that would, what, what the in-kind equivalent would be or the monetary equivalent would be. In terms of the um, the documentation, I, I think not, but there might be somebody a bit more familiar with this on the call that I will ask to chime into the to the Q and A, please. Um, yeah, okay, got Bert's question as well. So yeah, um, so that so that was a bit of a suggestion, uh, Bert, trying to diversify the revenue. Any other questions before before I wrap up? Any questions about, uh, we've got a question from Jim. Ah, what would be the good first step in attaining high visibility? Yeah, so your context will, will probably be different, but I think um, a lot of times, like if you're in a smaller community, just, just tooting your horn about your results. Ideally, like if you've got an evaluation with some really positive results about your impact, you know, just, just letting people know. Sometimes we kind of limit our marketing to the annual report, report, right? Who reads annual reports? You're trying to get at uh, people who typically don't know about who you are and what you do. So, you know, uh, submitting uh, articles for the paper, if you're in a smaller community, that's a lot easier than doing something in the larger community. I will tell you that um, there's a woman, I'm just gonna see if I can type. There's a woman called Kivi LaRue and she focuses uh, did I send that? Did that go? Why didn't it send? Oh, I see. Okay, I've just sent it. I've put her name in the Q&A for you, and she's kind of an expert in nonprofit marketing, and that might be a first step for you uh, to do a little bit of an investigation. And I can hear Rand, uh, Randy, so can I just finish my last? Uh, so he, we're circling back to the objectives for this hour, and I said that you would be able to list the factors associated with greater sustainability. You might not be able to have all 28 memorized, but you do have your handout. And that you would be able to, the, to do the worst case scenario exercise when you go back to your organization and really get a sense of, you know, how are we gonna move forward through, through this crisis? Um, I will tell you that um, if you're really interested to learn more, so I put everything into this guidebook, so it has step-by-steps -step on how to do a sustainability planning session with your organization, instructions for each of the activities. And I also have a free uh, Pinterest page where I collate resources on uh, sustainability planning as well. So there's a, so that's, uh, you can check that out as well. And uh, that's my website as well. I've got some free tip sheets and stuff for nonprofits there. I also, I know it seems a long way off, but I have a whole bunch of holiday songs, Christmas songs for nonprofits as well. Uh, things like Knocking Around the Strategic Plan and Oh Little Town of Oh Little, oh I forget, I forget what they are. But anyways, if you're looking for something interesting for your office Christmas party, you can find that on my website. And at that, I'm gonna pass it back to Randy. Thank you so much. That was great. I took I took a number of notes, uh, and I appreciate that. And 
Yes, Kibby is amazing. So you should totally reach out to her. Um, again, thank you. I And also, congratulations. You are the winner of the most random movie reference that I've ever had. <laughs> 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 I so yeah. appreciate that. I, I loved in, in the chat, someone had said, uh, embarrassingly, yes, I've heard of this. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. There's, all, there's more to it, but I will, I will, I'll let people figure that part out themselves. Yeah. I'm sure, yes, if, if, if you are, are still spending a lot of time in front of um, Amazon Prime or Netflix or whatever, I'm, I'm guessing it's somewhere out there in the world. It's probably free on the internet at this point. Yeah. It probably is, yeah. It's actually a good movie. It is a good movie. I yeah. have put the Pinterest link back up on the screen for you folks, and you will find a look uh, a link on, at that site to the sustainability guide, or just go to my website, communitysolutions.ca, and you can find that there. All right, well, thanks again, Kylie, and thanks to everyone that joined. This is such an important topic for your organization, uh, and so thank you for bringing it to light today. And with that, go out and do some uh, some of these exercises and get your nonprofiting in good shape. Thanks a lot, right. everyone. Thanks, Randy. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.